Okay. Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, my friends, I'm literally glowing because the sun is rising here in Queensland, Australia. It is a beautiful morning. And today I have the pleasure of introducing you to someone that many of you would in fact know or had heard of or read in many of his books. He's most notably known for the book Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus or Women Are From Venus. John Gray, or Dr. John Gray, I should say, is on the show today. Now, John, instead of me gushing about all the other incredible things that you do and why you actually do it, I thought it would be best to switch the introduction over to you and ask John, from your own mouth or from in your own words, are you able to please explain who you are and what you do? So, Dr. John Gray, please take it away. Well, um, a little bit of my past. In my 20s, I was a, a celibate monk. Uh, then in my 30s, I got married and uh, had the normal kind of challenges couples have and discovered that most of the, I became a counselor and most of the problems men and women were having, they weren't understanding at that moment where their partner was coming from. And I was able to be objective. You know, it's always easy to see other people's problems than your own. So I would pretty much see that there was a misunderstanding of where men were coming from, where women were. And I grew up in a family with uh, five brothers and then I became a monk. So I had a, a already I had a clear understanding of masculinity. And and also because of my spiritual side, I wasn't as reactive to things. I could be more compassionate and empathetic, which was a great formula for beginning to understand how men and women typically misinterpret each other because uh, we're different and we're not, we're, you know, so many similarities between men and women, of course, but at times of stress, at times of challenge, those differences become exaggerated. And that's where I was able to help couples find peace and understanding and compassion and empathy very efficiently. And that's, I wrote my breakthrough book, uh, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. I've written two books before, one on just healing the heart, finding love and forgiveness, which are also important skills. And then I wrote a big book called Men, Women, Relationships, which is 10 years of my research into gender differences. And that book did so well, they asked me to write another one shorter. And that became Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. And that was over 25 years ago. And I continue teaching Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. But I did add-ons, you know, based on people's questions. Mars, Venus on a date. Mars, Venus get married. Mars, Venus together forever. Mars, Venus in the bedroom. <laughs> so Mars, Venus in love. Uh, you know, life is filled with the, these challenges. And really, the the big challenges are, are we all face are always money. And the other challenge is maintaining a loving relationship. We can find heartfelt feelings. And my specialty is the love part. And just because you have money, it's not enough to have the love part. And just because you have the love part, it's not enough to have money. So they're two different realms, and I focus on the relationship part. Well, Dr. John Gray, welcome so much to the Storybox podcast today. I mean, you mentioned something that was extremely interesting that I want to touch on first, which is you were a monk. And I wanted to ask you what attracted you to wanting to be a monk in the first place. And then why did you leave? Well, uh, you know, I, I grew up in the 60s. I'm 72 now. And so in the 60s, the summer of love, I'm, <laughs> uh, it's freedom. It was, um, you know, free sex. You don't have to wait till you're married. That was a big breakthrough. You can demonstrate against the war instead of going and killing people. You could demonstrate for peace. And uh, something was happening in my generation where being traditional male, we could break free from that. And uh so basically, I broke free from that and got high, got romantic experiences and all that. But it, I crashed, you know, after Woodstock, uh, high for a weekend, I just crashed. And I said, there must be another way to get high without drugs, without sex, all that. And the Beatles, who were very popular then, had gone to India to study with the Maharishi. And so I just learned Transcendental Meditation. And it was a, a thing at that time. And I thought, well, he's the head of it. I want to I want to learn from him. So I spent nine years with him, mimicking him, becoming like him. He was like my 
mentor, somebody who knew more than me, who was a world teacher, was very successful, very happy all the time, but also making a difference. So that was my role model. He was a Hindu monk. So I became a Hindu monk oh. and I was celibate for nine years. I, my, my main, your main focus was personal development. Uh, and I say after nine years, I developed quite a bit. I found a greater sense of connection with spirit, a connection with love, a connection with myself. You know, people always would say self-realization. Well, part of self-realization is just knowing I'm good enough. I deserve more. I make a difference. I'm in a world that's friendly towards me. I can learn lessons all the time. That was my self-realization. And to realize ultimately I'm creating my reality. Other people affect my reality, but I have the power to generate the life I want. And that's a very important relationship skill. So after nine years of celibacy, I started having sex again. And that brings up a lot. I'll tell you, I, you know, you can be Mr. Love as long as you're not sitting in front of a mirror every day saying, well, you didn't do this and you didn't do that, whatever. So I was all loving and I am a loving person. Uh, but being in a relationship, if you have this ability, maturity is to self-reflect on how am I contributing to the problem. And I think that's what helped me a lot as a Mars Venus a teacher is we really are th- most people who get married, they think they're doing the best thing. They think they're doing the best thing. But if you don't understand that maybe what the best thing on your planet could be different for the best thing on their planet. And, and that's a concept. And then practical uh, expressions of that would be misunderstandings. For example, if, if, if I come to you and you're an expert and I say I have a problem, I'm expecting you to offer me suggestions and solutions and strategies and whatever. And and certainly as a uh, teacher, people come to me with a question. I want to solve their problem. I want to give them a strategy. So that's one way of handling problems. When your wife uh, is that you're in an intimate relationship, sometimes way more important than, quote, solving her problem is she needs to talk about her problem. She literally needs time to discuss it, to express it without my interruptions of saying, don't worry about it. Or it's not a big deal. I would see men doing this all the time. I said, just hold on, just sit there and let her talk some more. And they would they would learn from me to instead of offering a fix right away, hear what I would do is if it's a woman particularly, I would say, help me understand that better and tell me more. And what else? And what were you feeling at that time? And what do you think about that? So helping women be verbally introspective would always have the result of women coming back to a more loving place. Now, you you would think if men were just like women that you could do that. But no, uh, quite often, men just need to think about it for a while. They need to put it on a burner for a while. They need to mull it over. They need to figure out, well, what's the, if I'm upset, you know, what did I do wrong? How could I fix that? Mm. Now, if you if you're a man and you don't have this maturity of what did I do wrong? How can I fix that? Then you're lost into this, what did she do wrong? And always I can look at what she did wrong, but I keep that to myself because it's not productive to to throw your negativity on someone. But I would reflect on that. And then I would always ask the question, and this is where I would center myself again is, well, how did I contribute that? Because when you see that you contribute to problems, either through your misinterpretation, misunderstanding, by doing the wrong thing, unproductive thing, When you see that you're part of the problem, you can solve it. And when men feel they can solve the problem, they feel great. And when a woman feels a man can give me what I need, suddenly she starts to feel great. And that, you know, a lot of practical examples came from that. But I just want to give one practical example of understanding we're coming from a different place. Many times when men interrupt women with solutions, they think that's what she's asking for. Because typically men don't talk about problems unless they haven't figured out the solution. So they're going to an expert. There's Mm -hmm. nothing wrong with that. First, a man will reflect on himself. You know, we we take great pride and look what I can do myself. And and as women today, now we have to update all this information. uh, Women have become so masculine, they often become like men. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And and they often read read men are from Mars and they kind of go, well, I feel like I'm from Mars. 
So that became the theme of my later books. Uh, one, one of them is called Beyond Mars and Venus, which means when we are not in a traditional relationship, quite often, this has been my experience, is if you're not in a traditional relationship or you don't have traditional goals, like I'm looking forward to getting married, having children, having a family. If you're a woman and you're just looking forward to making money and having a career and save the world, your, your challenges in a relationship, if you do decide to be in one, are going to be different. Yeah. And, and for a man, if you don't feel, I want to provide for a woman, uh, I'm committed to her, I want to provide for her, I want to create a family, uh, but you feel like, I just want to do what feels good to me, which is what we did in the 60s, to do what feels good. There was one song back then called Do What You Like. And I remember that at Woodstock. It's just like, do what you like, do what you like. It's like a mantra. Well, when men just do what they like, they become more feminized. And when mm -hmm. women do what they don't like, but in order to make money, they become more masculine. So I started seeing these dynamics. And, and so I had to write a book to explain to women, which is my new theme, which is if, you, if you're more on your male side, you relate to being from Mars and you're a woman. And these women, by the way, will always say, I keep meeting these men and they're all feminized. You know, they're in touch with their feelings in the beginning. It's nice. But then after a while, they're so needy. Yeah. Uh, women get turned off to that. But what, and they say, I need a real strong man. Somebody there. What she needs is to learn how to be feminine because she feels if I'm with a really strong man, then I can depend on him. I can relax. But actually, they have huge resistance to connecting with their female side. And that's what's happened today is that, you know, when a man is, uh, for example, has an addiction, that what I would explain is his female side. Whenever you're dependent on something to make you happy, nothing wrong with that. I depend on food. I depend on you to bring my message out into the world. So if I'm depending on others for something that gives me fulfillment, that produces female hormones. And that's a fact. Okay. That's just a fact. And when I'm depending on myself to solve problems and fix things and, and face crisis and danger, any of those kind of things, for a man, that will produce testosterone. Now, why do I need more testosterone? Why do I have to be careful about too much estrogen? Because when a man is stressed, okay, we just look at an example. If his body's producing stress hormones, we don't want that all the time. Occasionally, we can have it. Yeah. And, you know, Pretty much people understand the whole idea of cortisol and stress today. But simply put, when you're, when you're producing cortisol, blood flow stops going to the prefrontal cortex of the brain. And that's the only place where you're an adult and you can have love. Before prefrontal cortex is the limbic system where you're just reacting what your body does in danger, what your parents did in danger, what your parents do when they feel threatened. You know, like maybe your father didn't achieve all his goals because he was afraid. He wanted to stay safe. Well, then we, we have an opportunity to move ahead, but we got to go, oh, I'll just do what dad did. That's the reactive brain. We tend to copy our parents. And it's all subconscious, but it's only in the prefrontal cortex where we can break out of conditioning and become more self-development, self-improvement, self-correction. That's, that's where we want to get to. You can't do that. You can't do that if you're in a state of fight or flight. You also can't be compassionate in a state of fight or flight. You can't adjust yourself. You can't find forgiveness. You can't look at things very reasonably at the same time lovingly. That's kind of a, a balance of these two things. Do what's reasonable because it works, but which is also life supporting and productive. So that's why we don't want this, this elevated stress all the time. Well, it turns out that whenever a man is not making enough testosterone, he's gonna have elevated stress levels. And he will tend to have elevated estrogen levels. That's the female hormone. And whenever a woman is experiencing that same hormone that a man feels, cortisol, she'll be producing excess testosterone and not enough estrogen. So it's like a seesaw. Mm. So it's just simple logic. My message is always so simple once we understand what's real. So what's real is that when women are making more testosterone, they have a greater risk of being in stress state. And when men are making more estrogen, they have a greater risk of being in fight or flight, which means something paradoxical is we often think about testosterone and aggression. But actually, if the aggression, it could be just emergency. I got to solve this problem. You can do it with your heart open. 
But when a man is angry or a man is scared, he's actually making more estrogen than testosterone. Yeah, right. Now, why is this so important? Because biologically, men, in order to not be stressed, they have to have a mindset, a circumstance, a relationship with themselves and the world or a partner or so forth through relationship. In relationship, like I'm in relationship with you now, so I'm not just limiting it to just marriage and to all the people listening. I'm in relationship to my pet. I'm in relationship to the planet. All these relationships we have are very are the most governing factor of our hormones. If you're if I'm giving a talk and I'm doing my thing and everybody's bored, my testosterone will go low. If I'm giving a talk and people are like rapt attention, just like you, like, this is great. You're smiling. Every, that pumps testosterone into my body. Now, what's, it would do the same thing for a woman. Mm. But the difference biologically is that men, in order to cope with stress efficiently, he needs to make 10 to 20 times more testosterone. And for a woman, for her to cope with stress efficiently, she needs to be making 10 times more estrogen than a man, average man, happy man, and 20 times more in order to have romantic feelings and to have orgasm, for example, or to feel romance or to feel I love, I feel loved and cherished. You know, all those feelings directly are controlled by our relationships or our interpretation of relationship because we're mental beings. How am I interpreting my relationships? But relationship is a governing factor that stimulates hormones in my body. So relationships that make me feel successful and being able to make a difference, that's going to raise my testosterone. Now, if a woman is over there, that's not a problem at all, as long as she also has the right amount of estrogen. So if a woman's out there working a job and feeling I'm not getting paid enough, which is propaganda, yeah, uh, we now know that women who uh, have a college degree who don't have children make thirty percent more than men for the same job. And if you're if you don't have a college degree and you have children, then suddenly you go down to making a little bit less than a man, just a little bit less on average. These are all, but these women who who don't have children, they're going to put more into their job. They're going to work more hours, and suddenly they're making way more money than men. So, but if you're walking around. As, as a woman and you feel I'm not getting paid enough, that means I'm not getting supported. That's what raises estrogen is when you feel I have support. And then we have such an atheistic society, uh, which basically, and I'm not in favor of any one religion or whatever, but if you don't have a clear awareness of a higher power of an intelligence in the universe, however you want to define it, that's a huge support of estrogen for women and a huge support of testosterone. For men, it works like this. If you believe in a higher power, then if I do good, I will always be rewarded, okay? Because that's what produces testosterone is the anticipation that I will get rewarded. And for women, the belief of God basically feels that if I'm loving God will always forgive me and God will always support me. So I will have support. I'm not alone. See, for women, the major source of depression is feeling alone. I'm not alone. And if you just even before you can get all the way into depression, you just have stress state when a woman is feeling overwhelmed, which is very common today. And I watched it as a counselor over 40 years. Women began using this phrase more and more and more as they became more on their male side. And the male side it solves problems to feel good. And what is overwhelmed with this feeling of I have so much to do, so many problems to solve, but I have no time. I have no support. And that feeling of no time, no support, not enough money, not enough love, all those feelings of not enough are characteristic to a stress state in women and also characteristic to low estrogen that this is like amazing it just becomes abc so now let's come back to practicality i want to have a successful relationship with a woman i have no there's things i can do that will help her estrogen come back up mm. there's things i can do that will push her estrogen down so i should avoid those things <laughs> and a woman can learn there's things she does 
that will push a man's testosterone down. And then his motivation is gone. His desire is gone. His ability to feel love comes with testosterone. So, so if she learns, oh, I, I need to, you know, my husband's not treating me the way I want to be treated. I need to do things that will bump up his testosterone. And he'll be like that guy who knelt before me and proposed. That's a peak moment of testosterone. Yep. And a man, you know, I tell him, look, it, I want you to do these things I suggest because they will, they're, and it's not even just I suggest them. Once you understand the suggestion, it's just common sense. What things will increase estrogen in her? And otherwise she'll stop having orgasms or she never has an orgasm, basically, which it really, really is, I'm using that as a symbol that men perk up with, <laughs> that I'm a happy wife. And it's very, very important for her to be able to experience that peak that's what orgasm is. It's a peak estrogen level for a woman. Now, everything I say, there's subtleties to it, because if you're using a vibrator, women, you have an orgasm. That's not a peak of uh, estrogen. That's a peak of testosterone. It's a male. See, women can be like men and they can have a climax, but it doesn't have the same biological effect on the body as when a man is actually having intercourse with you and providing that stimulation in your vagina as opposed to the clitoris. The clitoris stimulates testosterone. The vagina stimulates estrogen. Uh, and the clitoris is, is good to increase a woman's desire up to a certain point, but then it's the surrender, it's the opening, it's that allows estrogen to go up. It's hard for women to get there when they feel stressed, when they feel in danger, because their testosterone is too high mm. and their estrogen is too low. So culture... For thousands, for hundreds of years, we'll put it this way. I've actually, the mating processes are in animals, you know. An elk will have to follow a woman for weeks, I think, before she'll open up to him. I was just in Africa, and the tiger has to, for a week, he's following the female tiger around, <laughs> trying to get sex. <laughs> She's making him work <laughs> for it. All that are in, male instincts, female instincts, is that you need a certain kind of stimulation in order for a female to have estrogen go up. And that's what we call romantic rituals. Now, romantic rituals are still helpful, but they're not enough today. you got to get your basics of the romantic rituals. They're not enough. Why? Because the function of a romantic ritual is to help women go back to producing estrogen. So what is a romantic ritual? Oh, I'm going to do something that you will really like. Not what I like necessarily, but what you will like. I'm going to dress in a way that makes you feel that I care about you. I'm going to treat you in a way that says, I care about you. You're a priority. I already know some of the things that you like and you want, or I'm going to ask questions of what is it that makes you happy and fulfilled. And for romance, I'm going to do that for you to show you how important you are. I'm going to open doors for you. I don't open doors for my wife all the time, but on a romantic date, I do everything for her. Well, what's that about? It's around when women can feel, I have everything I need right now. He's not talking on the phone. He's not talking business. I have his full attention. Attention is very key. Uh, he, he has positive feelings about me. He does things for me. This is huge as far as estrogen goes. So it allows her to shift from her male side, which is, if I want something done, I have to do it myself, <laughs> to his female side, which is, I don't have to do it all. I have help. I'm not overwhelmed. I can relax. You see, so so this just opens a whole doorway to make sense of traditional romantic rituals. And as I said, they're not enough because they weren't designed at a time where they were designed at a time where women were already making pretty much estrogen throughout the day. And this would just take her from healthy estrogen, which is 10 times higher than a man's estrogen to 20 times higher, which is where she could have romantic feelings. And then when it gets about 15 times higher than an actual man, uh, your estrogen, then her body will start making testosterone. This is proven that a woman's estrogen gets so high, then she'll start making testosterone, kind of like a balance. And that creates her desire to have sex with a man. And so all of our rituals are how to help women's estrogen go up so they want to have sex rather than man trying to figure out when she wants sex. How do I get her to have sex? What do I have to do to get sex? Why? You know, women are very complicated when it comes to sex. Men are not. 
Why is that? Because for a woman to have sex, there's a there's a consequence. There's a lifetime consequence. You have to make a baby. You would need to be protected and cared for during that period of raising the baby. You will always feel responsible for that child. Whereas a man, he can keep making babies and babies and babies. It doesn't he doesn't get pregnant. He doesn't even know he has children out there. So there's a dynamic here of biologically. There's little consequence for a man to have sexual attraction, sexual desire to have sex. Uh, his sort of pressure is to go out and find a mate to have sex. And when he have, finds the right mate, this is very interesting, when he finds a woman who he feels committed to and she gives him the right with support, which is uh, a, a kind of appreciation, a trust and acceptance of his imperfections. When a man gets that, that kind of love is very, very powerful to raise his testosterone. So when a man can be with a woman where her love raises his testosterone very high, this is now shown again. His body will make a hormone called prolactin, which is normally women produce it to feed a baby. Milk, milk, a child has the milk from the mother. Uh, the prolactin, the effect it has on a man keeps him from being interested in having sex with other women. <laughs> His monogamy is built into our biology if you find the right woman. The tragedy is you can be with the right woman, but she doesn't have the skills to communicate what he needs to bump his testosterone up and vice versa. Hard for her to have those feelings if he doesn't have the skills that create a safety and understanding, a message of caring and prioritizing and attention for her to have her estrogen go so high that he will then bond with her for a lifetime. And that's a possibility if your body can make the right hormone, prolactin. Now I'm going to throw another monkey wrench into it. Cultures have always talked about uh, minimizing or avoiding masturbation for men. Yes. I was going to ask that. when you masturbate, let's say you have prolactin with your partner and it grows over time. That's why it takes time for your prolactin levels to go up to where you're able to make that commitment. And with that, with that prolactin going up, if you masturbate, your prolactin levels go down. Yeah. And now you're horny again. You're looking for another woman. Basically, masturbation stimulates not only lowering prolactin or keeping it low, but it also produces so much dopamine the addictive brain chemical, uh, so much intensity that your receptor sites downregulate. And now uh, a, a, a woman that you could feel love for and you, your estrogen goes up when you're in her presence along with testosterone, but you're feeling love, it, it doesn't uh, stimulate much testosterone. You need intensity. You need porn. You need impersonal sex. See, this is, again, paradoxical. Uh, the more you love a woman, if you don't get that love back, your testosterone goes down and other women who are non-personal will produce more testosterone because it produces dopamine. Anytime you do anything which is impersonal, which is sexual, you will have way more dopamine than you have with your partner. There's a little bit of an exception on that, which is in the newness of a relationship. You're having a sexual relationship first time or first three months, for some people, first three years, you will get super high levels of dopamine having sex with her. But once, once the newness goes away, familiarity sets in, you, you don't have that free dopamine. And what does that free dopamine do for a man? It raises his testosterone so he can bond with his partner. What does that dopamine do for a woman? it raises her estrogen so she can bond with him. But after a while, you don't get free drugs. You don't get free dopamine. And so passion goes away in relationships. And nobody knows how to solve this. Historically, for thousands of years, couples just lost the passion, but that was acceptable in those days. That was called the honeymoon period. And you, know, you didn't marry someone, I, theoretically, because there was passion. You married somebody who was... For a man, she's very, uh, you're attracted to her, but the woman would pick a man who has a good job, who can protect her. And, you know, the parents would figure this stuff out. Who's a good mate for you? Uh, you don't just go based upon your feeling of love and attraction because that newness goes away. 
So now we have a world where we want to pick our partners. We don't want our parents to do it, so forth. And we follow our feelings. But the feeling we have in the beginning is kind of an altered drug-like state. It's the newness which is there. And so we feel all this passion. And when it goes away, we feel dissatisfied because we haven't been conditioned to know that will go away. <laughs> that just goes away. We, we're kind of like, well, I want it to continue going. Now, people like me uh, and other people are saying, you can have lot, that attraction for a lifetime. And mm. I do have it for a lifetime. Uh, I'm 72 years old. The passion is just like it was, but different. It is still different. It's not like I touch her and electricity yeah. goes through my body. You know, everybody can remember that first date where you touch fingers, you know. Yeah, close like off, let's go. <laughs> well, that's arriving for the, that's connecting for the first time. There'll be a drug-like level of dopamine and which will raise your testosterone, increases attraction from the man to the woman. And likewise for a woman, her estrogen goes up. He kissed me or he asked me questions. He called me, you know, big surges of, of estrogen. Then you're married 10 years. He called me, doesn't do anything. <laughs> you're, you're holding your hand on a date 10 years later, nothing, nothing's happening, right? So that's normal and natural. But what's possible is in that comfort, which we all want comfort and ease in our lives. In that comfort and ease, you can also have this passion emerge when you're private and you're in the bedroom and it comes up and it's better than it was in the beginning. That's the possibility here. It charges you up. Uh, you know, it's hard to feel strong desire. Passion is strong desire. When you have something, you know, it's like once I found the house for me, it's like I'm not lusting after other houses. I'm not trying to change houses. I'm very satisfied with my house I'm, and I'm glad I'm comfortable with it. I got what I want. So you're not going to feel that same passion. But something can happen in the bedroom where when you begin to undress and you cuddle with each other and you kiss each other and you express love to each other and you do certain physical movements that will actually raise testosterone in a man, raise estrogen in a woman. You can go much higher in terms of testosterone and estrogen than you did in the beginning. So this is this is the new possibility is that so many people will, will come to me and say, well, how do you keep that passion? How do you keep that? I said, well, what you do is in the beginning, it's based upon dopamine, which is newness or danger. OK, newness or danger and challenge various things. So the dopamine is there. It raises the testosterone in men, raises estrogen in women. Sex is great. Traction is there and so forth. It's all based on this artificially induced state of dopamine. When dopamine comes back to normal levels, that's when reality sets in. And that's really where you can experience true love. You know, true love. There's one kind of love which is based upon Let's say I give you a check for a million dollars and you go, wow, I feel so happy. And then you find out the check bounced. OK, <laughs> then you're really unhappy. But there's the reality. Let's say it's real and I need some gold. And you go, this is great. I've got gold. OK, real stuff. So this is after the dopamine levels start coming back down to normal life together. You can still have the attraction if you have sk communication skills, lifestyle skills, behavioral skills that raise a man's testosterone and raise a woman's estrogen. You don't have to have new and different. You don't have to have a, a shot of cocaine or caffeine or anything. You're not dependent on dopamine anymore in order to feel completely alive as a man and really happy and alive for a woman. Okay, this is this dynamic, which we have, if we learn to create polarity, then you can sustain the attraction in the bedroom. And outside of the bedroom, then you have tremendous amounts of love. And the over time, which is ironic, now I'm a test case for this because I'm an expert on this, right? I'm 72 years old. And the attraction is in the bedroom is more than when I was young. It lasts longer. I go to higher levels and I do more of it. Okay? Oh. I can do more of it like almost every day because... Because I'm also slightly retired. You know, these are the benefits of creating a life where you don't have to <laughs> you have more time. There were benefits when I was young and, and I had children and they're all growing up. That's an amazing benefit. Certainly, I didn't have as much sex then because your busy energies are going to your children and so forth. But what I commit to couples, at least, at least once a week, you need to have it. Uh, it's very, very important 
Uh, otherwise, women's estrogen levels start to go down, men's testosterone levels go down. Even if you're not feeling like it, you need to get into bed. You need to kiss each other, touch each other, massage each other and see what happens. No goal, but you need to get naked. And there's a lot of skills I teach as well uh, to reawaken the passion without goals. It's very interesting. It's very fun to know I can help couples re revitalize this amazing feeling in the bedroom, which I think is so, so important for longevity, for health, for vitality. We know now hormones play a big role in longevity and health and happiness. I guess I should let you ask some questions, but I had <laughs> I'm busy talking. <laughs> no, I've been listening quite intensely and a lot of the questions that I did have for you actually answered during that uh, that explanation, which I'm, I'm grateful for. And you touched on something which I think is really, really important, especially in today's society. And I've also heard uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman talk about it with Jordan Peterson about the level of prolactin when men masturbate and they watch porn. So they're basically they're trying to imagine themselves being with that particular woman. So the level of prolactin is like you're attaching yourself to that woman on the screen, but it's a false sense of reality. It's nothing like getting the real thing. But I guess my my question to you is, uh, Dr. Gray, what? how do we help young boys or young men when it comes down to the pornography issue? Because it is so prevalent in today's society and it's ruining so many relationships because a lot of young men, they get bored real quick. They're just like, why would I want to stay with one woman when I can have so many women at my fingertips straight away on the screen? And then when it comes down to like them actually experiencing the real thing, there's a lot of issues that arise from that. Like, you know, uh, um, anxieties, you, you name it, all kinds of issues that stem from watching this fake entertainment thing that people have decided to create. So I guess, how do we help society at the moment and how can women also help young boys or young men in this particular situation, aside from just saying, go away? <laughs> that is such a great question. That is, that is such an important question. And it was a big question. <clears throat> I'll start with education. Mm. So addressing the part of uh, how do we teach our sons about masturbation? First of all, I have to make a note that right now there's a movement in the direction of calling masturbation self-love. Yeah. And there's, there's a movement towards sexual education, uh, which teaches children uh, about their genitals and it feels good and to touch them and how to touch them. And it feels Four years really old. good. Four years old, four yeah. or five years old books in schools crazy it is crazy it's the wrong direction uh if you look at culture throughout time uh to masturbate you know was seen as not a good thing and whenever we do something that's not a good thing we feel shame afterwards and there's a uh, uh, people want to say oh you should do it but not feel ashamed and if you feel ashamed it's because the culture is telling you that's not a good thing but actually it's not a good thing <laughs> so <laughs> It's like if I lose money uh, at a business deal and I got tricked or fooled or whatever, I feel ashamed. OK, I don't want to admit that. I, I will feel the shame. I just lost all that. I, I, then I'll self-correct and love myself. OK, I can do that. But if I repeat it, you know, fool me twice, <laughs> you should feel ashamed. It's, it's a natural instinct to feel shame when you've done something where you lose. Now, what do you lose when you masturbate? You lose your life force. Mm -hmm. And so how to explain this to a child, uh, a mother can do this. Ideally, a father does it. And ideally, it doesn't have to happen <laughs> when they're young. OK, <laughs> you know, generally, it's, I didn't I know anything about this till I started till I was in puberty. And that's where there was a surge of testosterone, which increases the uh, testosterone 10 times. OK, yeah. so that's 10 times. Uh, but there are some children that will masturbate, particularly autistic boys have a tendency to masturbate a lot because uh, they're addictive. Uh, you know, their, their brain is there's an imbalance. And so there's an addiction. If you stroke the penis up and down, uh, it will produce a tension uh, that will cause ejaculation. 
And it, it feels really good, but then it intensifies by stroking it up and down, and then you ejaculate. And a, a little child won't, won't ejaculate, but what will happen is they get addicted to the intensity of stroking it up and down. It will make dopamine. It's very pleasurable. And we know, you know your children want to eat ice cream. It's pleasurable. Well, you can't eat so much, okay? You've got to put a limit on cookies and ice cream, right? So this is what we do as parents and what a child's doing privately. So let's take the worst case scenario. You have a child who is just um, very young and they're doing that. Uh, what you would then do with the child is, although I've never done this, but I, I, I know what I do with teenage boys and explain to them, you don't want to ejaculate. And a mother can do this to her, so tell her son this, but you can also have a father do it. Take the son aside and say, you know, now you're probably getting these erections all the time. I know it feels good. It's going to be a little careful with it because you can touch it and move up like this and it will feel good for a while and then let it go. It's kind of like eating ice cream. You don't want to eat too much. Mm. And, but if you go up and down, attention develops and your ejaculation comes out. And every time that happens, uh, you're going to lose a little bit of your strength and a little bit of your brain power, your intelligence and memory. That juice inside of you goes towards, you know, when you're older, it will come out and you make a baby. But meanwhile, right now, it's building your brain. Your brain's still developing and your muscles are still developing. And that juice, uh, that liquid helps your body to regenerate itself. Once you're an uh, adult, then you can lose a little bit of that because you make a baby from that. So you give it a logical explanation of this. I have a more complicated explanation just in terms of the dopamine uh, being produced when you produce that much intensity. You see what an ejaculation is, it's an intensity that built, you increase the intensity of it and your body finally says, uh, I need to uh, relax. I need to release the tension. I need to release that life force that I'm stimulating by arousing myself. I'm stimulating a lot of energy. It's too much. And the body has a, like a, sh a, a fuse blows. And afterwards you just kind of <laughs> you feel like shit really. Uh, <laughs> If you do have a lot of stress in your life, you'll feel relaxed, okay? Because, uh, but if you're feeling good, if you're aligned with life and you're flowing, oh my God, if I was to masturbate, and I have at times, I, I wrote a book on this, so I had to do some porn just to see the reaction of it. <laughs> it's devastating for me. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people, so I don't notice anything different. That's because they're using a very low level of their potential, okay? So, but, you know, I was a monk for nine years. I meditate. I have higher consciousness, you know, I... I have well-being literally all the time. I don't have stress reactions at all. Uh, so then suddenly that kind of a awareness takes a lot of uh, life force to sustain. Also, what I've learned just as a little biohacking thing is that at 72, to maintain the wisdom and the consciousness and the love and the sexual potential that I have, I don't need to eat as much. Hmm. It's, a, it's as simple as that. I have those little glucose monitors. My blood sugar is very stable. But literally, if I eat too much, I lose some of my higher consciousness. I even learned this a long time ago when I would uh, teach seminars for me. I'm just talking for me. But if I was to give a, a talk and I ate before the talk, the amount of energy it takes to digest that food keeps me from being in a peak, peak awareness. Uh, and so when you're in a place of peak awareness, you really don't need as much food. Uh, your body's very, very efficient in utilizing the nutrients you have. Uh, but when you're building a body, certainly you need lots of food and kids need it and everything like that. But as you grow up, you, your priority needs to be and, and, and maintaining this wisdom and this consciousness and this sexual potency that you have. Now, a part of my sexual potency is also I'm a big fan of non-goal-oriented sex, which is, mm -hmm. you know, at a certain point, men get into the pleasure and then their goal is to intensify it or to have an ejaculation, which we call an orgasm. Actually, it's just an ejaculation. It puts the end <laughs> to it. If you go, if, if you pause and, and if you start again and start again and start again, when you get close to an ejaculation and you start again, uh, well, why don't you stop and start again? That doesn't mean you stop. It just means you do something different than, than trying to intensify then you can you experience a new dimension in making love where you have orgasms as a man, as a woman, where it doesn't end and you become, quote, orgasmic. So that's our orgasmic potential. And you can start experiencing that if you're a man by just 
occasionally just don't get to that point of ejaculation and stop and just see how you feel afterwards. Okay. <laughs> if you get too close to that point, you'll have blue balls. So uh, then you got to back off, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, I, I would, I'd like to share a few more techniques if that works. Yeah, please. I would love to hear okay. them. Okay. Uh, and this only works if you have a, you're in a committed and loving relationship. It's very, very hard if you're not. Okay. Because the, see, the, the love that you feel for a woman allows her to react with more love. And it's that love that allows your testosterone to go higher and higher. You know, it's a much higher level. It's like I'm 72 and my testosterone levels, just not having sex right now, uh, even relaxed watching the sunset, my testosterone levels are 50% higher than when I was a young man. So that's the potential here. I haven't measured them while I'm having sex, but I'm sure that's just off the chart. Uh, the, the, your energy never drops if you don't ejaculate. Your yeah. connection to your partner doesn't dissipate. See, when a man ejaculates, his testosterone crashes down afterwards to what we'll call baseline, as opposed to be higher than his baseline. A man's baseline goes down 1% every year now. Okay, that's this amazing statistic. Uh, yeah. The average male, his testosterone levels are 50% lower than just 50 years ago. Uh, this is shocking. And it, it, this is a powerful tool. One is relationship stimulates testosterone if it's a loving relationship where you're supporting each other's polarity. Remember, it's polarity. You know, there are men who are married, their testosterone levels are really low. The wife's complaining he's passive and she doesn't know how to bump it up. So now she's complaining all the time, which just pumps it down even more. He's ignoring her. So she doesn't have estrogen going up. <laughs> so so they, they're just sedentary marriage. And finally, she says, look, I'm suffering too much. I'm going to divorce. OK, so usually it's her and, and she'll but not always, but she'll say, I'm done with this. And so they have a divorce. They go to a counselor who doesn't know what to do to re reawaken, doesn't point out their gender confusion that's going on. Uh, and, and so they get their divorce. And then she she's all angry because after the after a few months of the divorce, he's already having sex with some woman. <laughs> he's, he's got a new suit. He's working out in the gym. You know, he's fixing his diet. He's losing weight. He's motivated. What just happened? Mm. Well, he, he's facing new and different. Okay, I got to start over. That's, you know, anytime a man is challenged, new and different, danger, and I don't do anything, my life's going to go down. So now he's out of his comfort zone. His body is making testosterone. That affects his mind that says, okay, I got to show up here. I gotta, I'm motivated. I got to do something. Uh, it's just so amazing how relationship dramatically affects our hormones. And, and no one yet is talking about this, <laughs> but it's, it's because we don't have this knowledge of relationship to affect our hormones in a positive or negative way. Uh, what happens is women, as they go through menopause, they're, they're having to take estrogen. Uh, there is a real biological change with women. Uh, the, the eggs are unable to make babies. The eggs aren't making the estrogen. But the adrenal gland will make enough estrogen for a woman to be happy and fulfilled and have a great sex life. I have women in their late 70s, only because I don't have 80 the ones in their 80s. But I have women, 78 is my oldest, who as a student with her partner, who's a little bit younger, is uh, they're having sex twice a week. It's fantastic. It's orgasmic. It's fabulous. Uh, so there's no limit to a great sex life. And I just want to just say, you know, when you have making love, you have aliveness. It just brings so much into you. Now, but you want to sustain that. If you're having sex with strangers, uh, or porn or with yourself, you're just getting addicted to the dopamine that gets produced. And to the extent that you're dependent on dopamine, a real woman has no ability to turn you on over time because the threshold of testosterone is dependent upon dopamine. And when familiarity sets in, and for the younger generation, familiarity could be just having dating her a few times where he was aroused by her and now he can't be. Because his brain depends upon that high stimulation, which is caused when he goes up and down, rather than never trying to provoke an erection. That's the first thing. But if you're just horny and you're a, a teenager and, and this erection's there, uh, best thing, ignore it. Or if you want to touch it, 
but touch it going up without the goal of ejaculating. And you won't ejaculate unless you go up and down. It's building, it's like a pump. You got to pump it a little bit and, and it will ejaculate. But it's it's just going up. The Taoists uh, call that sharpening the knife. Okay, that's your tool. You need to sharpen it occasionally, but as much as you need to. Uh, and, and the more a man is on his female side, making more estrogen, he'll have a greater need to touch the penis. If a man is really on his male side, a teenager is being affirmed as a masculine being and given opportunities to, uh, particularly when we're developing our identities around puberty to 21, that's a, a time of belonging. He needs to be belonging with males doing male things. It's like I grew up in Texas. I became a cowboy. You know, I'd ride a horse and bring the cows in. I also studied karate. I was in the magazines as a karate kid. I was so yeah. little, I'm not that tall. So it was a phenomenon that I can do these kicks, you know, and I could do that. I was a little entrepreneur. My mother wanted me to be was kind of a, a real beer drinking man who took charge of the boys doing their paper routes, you know, make them into little capitalists. <laughs> so, so my dad was traveling a lot. So my mother went, well, if dad's not around, let's put him around men, mentors. You, you need to be around uh, masculine males, productive, mm -hmm. positive masculine males uh, for a little boy to learn and it learn and, and should be the things that uh, inspire him to be better. And, and that's the, what's missing today so much for our boys. That's part of the boy crisis is a boy needs to have a father available to him and a mother who is has positive feelings towards that male doesn't have to actually ideally it's your father it took mom and dad to make that child but mm -hmm. if it's not dad she needs to find another dad uh, where she and, and that dad doesn't even have to spend so much time with her son i'm giving practical solutions here he could just be going to the karate teacher he could be going to the the job where he's got a manager he could be going to you know into some uh, activity that's very masculine you know like I had friends' fathers, and that was very good for me. Who, because uh, my father wasn't always there, and and I go hunting. You know, I mean, this is male stuff. You need to kill stuff. Okay, <laughs> not that I had to keep doing it after I killed my first deer. I didn't want to do that anymore. <laughs> but, but you know, Texas, they gave me a rifle. I'm only 15 years old, <laughs> and, and you know, they didn't even think I hit the deer. But I looked in the scope. I'm a, I'm a pretty lucky first time at anything. I'm down the deer right away and thought, yay, great. I just killed this animal. We're all happy. We drove the truck over there. And, and they said, you have to shoot them in the shoulders so they can't run away because one bullet doesn't kill them. And I, so I shot him in the shoulders, went down, and then they gave me the pistol and I had to kill him as that deer's looking at me, gave mm -hmm. a pistol into the head. Boy, that affected me. <laughs> but uh, I realized there are, there are other jobs. That's not my job. I'm not that masculine, we'll say. <laughs> but the uh, I felt guilty. And then my mother told me, as long as you eat that, eat every every bit of that uh, deer, it's okay. Yeah, okay. So I was okay. That's good. That's good. <laughs> so I did eat it. Nobody in the family would eat any of it. <laughs> but it was in the freezer, right? The whole year. Right? So... But here's like a Texas initiation. Okay, there were, this is, I'm not saying you should do this, but these are traditions. Uh, when I shot that deer, we cut it open, heart, you know, still warm, and there's blood. I pulled the heart out. <laughs> they had me take off all my clothes, and they rubbed the blood. All, I rubbed, rubbed the blood, holding the heart all over my body. <laughs> talk, talk about an initiation. That was right, right, a passage. <laughs> that, that was a rite of passage. Uh, and I think uh, it, it, it's doing things that you don't normally think you can do. Okay. So I think for me personally, when I look at rite of passages, which I think there can be different cultures with different ways of doing it. For me, it was, I was traveling in Europe as a teenager and uh, I needed a place to stay. It was winter. There were no rooms available that I could afford. And so I got to this hotel. They had one room available, uh, but the hotel was just opening up. The heat wasn't working. 
And, and I was in, they didn't have blankets, but I had a sheet that they just washed. So it was wet sheet. I'm in a little tiny room <laughs> and I curled up under that sheet. I said, please, God, put me to sleep. <laughs> but we endured that horrible experience. And for many, many years after, whenever things were difficult, I would remember, well, I got through that one. I'll get through this one. And that's a very important experience for particularly for males. I got through that. I can deal with that. And, you know, when you look at some of the comic books and the superhero movies, there's a theme that you don't know what your superpower is until you need to apply it. You've got to take that out of your comfort zone and have to do it yourself. That's part of masculinity. And, you know, some some uh, I was just in Africa with the, uh, the the indigenous people there who lived in huts, you know, and they jump up and down <laughs> and they tell us about their culture. Uh but when the, the boy lives with the mother up until puberty, and then there's a ritual where the men come and take the boy away, and the mother screams, oh, please don't take the boy away. She already knows they're going to do it, but they they give the message to the little boy that mom still loves them. Mom didn't betray them, but the fathers took them, and the father takes them, and now they learn to sharp, sharpen their weapons together. You know, they're they're got their tools, and they sit around, they hear the stories, and they become a man. American Indians would do vision quests. You know, you go out there seven days and, you know, there's the boy has to be challenged. I think another challenge for me was I worked in a, like a McDonald's. It was a, a Jack in the box is what it was called. But I was, a, I was the one at the, at the, who the lowest level and I had to break down all the boxes. Mm. And I said, one day I won't have to break down boxes. And even today, I've got boxes in my house. I hired someone to break down those boxes so I don't have to do it. So, you know, give them a little suffering so they're motivated to climb the ladder of, of uh, uh, value, so to speak. So mm. these are all parts that don't fully relate to little girls. OK, it's it's see, they need to now their body is having a period. That means they're making lots of estrogen. If they don't make estrogen, they'll be moody. They'll be suicidal. They'll be. They'll feel unsafe as a little girl. They'll feel more masculine to avoid feeling the vulnerability. This is what's happening today with girls. And there's a whole movement of girls thinking they're boys or, or being non-gender. Yeah, which is very non-binary. Yeah, yeah, you're right, right. And it's because basically they don't have a culture that supports them and admires them for being feminine. You only get admired and recognized if you're masculine. So it's like a big motivation. Okay, look what I can do. Look what I can do. And I'm not saying it's bad for women to be on their male side. It's just stressful. Mm. And you can you can balance. You know, everything is lifestyle balance. It's so so very important in a culture that supports and admires women who get married as an aspiration. You get married, you find a good guy, he's gonna support you so you can have a baby and have a family together and grow old together. If this was an image. But how can children have that image if they don't see it? You know, someone asked me today, even in an interview, how, how do we teach this to our children? You, you show them it. You have to be that. You have to be happily married or happily engaged with the opposite sex if you have a boy or a girl. How can a girl grow up feeling I can depend on men if the father wasn't there and the mother couldn't depend on the man? And how can a little boy feel I, I can be good enough to make mom happy when he never saw a man do it? Mm -hmm. And he sees his mother is stressed out, overwhelmed, which literally almost all women are, unless they're feeling loved and supported in a relationship. And we don't see that in the news. We don't see that in the movies. It's not, you know, what we see is everybody's unhappy and it doesn't get airtime unless there's danger and violence and dissatisfaction and divorce. So one of the statistics in the book, which you wanted me to talk a little bit about, which is boy crisis. Uh, if you look now in America, it's not the same in Australia, but it's moving this direction everywhere. Uh, if you look at the black population, it's 60 to 70% of black boys growing up don't have a father in the home. Mm. Boom. Now, that doesn't mean I'm just avoiding my father. It means I've got a mother who's overwhelmed and stressed out. So she's not there for me. She's there for herself. I and mean, this, this is a, a challenge. Although I'm not questioning her love for her son and whatever. Often she'll look to her son and even smother him, which is you're, you're not like your father. You know, you make me happy. But if you're looking to your son to make you happy, 
you, that's just one part of a woman. She needs to look to another man to be a role model for that boy and also for her. Uh, a woman's happiness dramatically goes up in her life when she has a man supporting her. Mm-hmm. And that clearly, if a man's not supporting her, either absent or being cruel, uh, she's not going to be happy. So you need to have a happy home. And sometimes the rationale for divorce is, look, we've tried everything. It doesn't work. So we need a happy home. But then this woman takes nine years to start dating again until her kid grows up. No, start right away. Do this for your son. Do this for your daughter. Teach them that, well, your dad is, you know, we're just not right for each other. We bring out the worst of each other. He's still a good guy. We love him. He's wonderful. But I need to, there's other men too. So it's, a child needs this. So 70%, 60, 70% of black boys grow up with a father in the home. A lot of this is the government that actually, if you're a, a, a poor woman and you don't have a husband, the government gives you money for every child you have. It's just like a business. Stay victimized. Uh, and if you bring a husband into the home, you don't get your checks. But this is like insanity. And, and yeah. then the, the, when it comes to white boys, it's 40 to 50 percent in different parts of the country don't have a, a father in the home uh, helping to make the mother happy, help to take care of the life and so forth. So now what we have is everybody's depending on the government. And the more we depend on government, particularly women, okay, particularly women, they're looking for that. They need that estrogen hit. They don't have God anymore. Yeah. And then they're looking to the government to take care of them. Uh, and this has been a big problem because during these lockdowns, people were really being conditioned to depend on the government as opposed to depend on a man or depend yeah. on yourself if you're a man to provide for somebody else. And it's really quite addictive. Uh, even I have to say for myself, it was, you know, being able to stay home for two years. I'm in a situation where it didn't stress me out because I have enough financial support. I can also do Zoom calls and I could, you know, do my work, counsel over the phone. But staying home has become quite a good habit. <laughs> it, it took me a while to I'm get like- out there. And now I, I'm more and more I'm traveling and so forth and realizing I like that as well. And once again, that is when I started our our conversation. It's our relationship that stimulates the hormones. And an intimate relationship gives you peak hormones, but it doesn't last. You need to have relationship with the world. You have to have relationship with strangers. You have to have relationship with people who oppose you. These are all the multi, many different uh, relationships. And all we got during lockdown for a lot of people was relationship with fear. Mm. Uh, they don't have support and they, they are powerless to provide support. It was massively depressive. The violence level went up huge during the lockdowns. It's un- unhealthy for us not to have a life. And I'm a big fan of intimacy and making love and all that. But that's not enough. You've got to have a life where you're challenged if you're a man, where you're producing things and being productive. And for a woman, where you have various kinds of relationships, not just the relationship with a man but friendships with other women, support groups with other women, where you're part of a group with other women, where you have children, or you have, it's very, very important for women to have children or at least be in some philanthropic activity where someone is depending on them because that produces a very healthy level of estrogen. So that's called nurturing behaviors. And when women don't have children, they feel the need for nurturing behaviors and they start nurturing their husband treating him like a child, which will only lower his testosterone and only frustrate her because she's looking to him, not as a child, but someone she can actually connect with and depend on, as opposed to having a partner that depends on her so much. That's called the needy male. And that's happening more and more where women will say to me, I feel like I'm his mother, or I feel like I have to do everything, or he doesn't do anything. And and, well, that's not always true, but that's her perception of the whole thing. But it does hold him down. He needs to be, in a practical sense, the solution to her issues, the the hero in her life, the the lucky moment that he had that she has him. Likewise, I feel about my wife. I'm so lucky she's my wife. Okay, I'm fulfilled in that. So those are expressions of love. Whereas women, particularly when they don't have children, uh, they, that tendency, I need to nurture someone. I need to take care of someone. I need, I don't feel good unless someone needs me. Well, that's her male side. See, nurturing is paradoxical, but when you're nurturing someone, you're selfless 
And that's masculinity. See, all masculinity is selflessness. We're going into the army. We go into the woods. We go into the danger. We're the hunter gatherers. We do the dirty things, the, the, the difficult things. This was always part of the male role. We thrived in it. I like doing difficult things. I like mm. being the only guy who could do this. You know, Fine. that feels good. And that's the male side. And as you mature, you get more and more confident. Then you can also maintain estrogen with your testosterone levels. And that's where you love what you do. Like you're, you work hard and you love it. That's a balance of your masculine feminine. It's, it's like, it's hard to say I'm working right now because I'm having such a good time, but this is also my work and it's taken years to develop it. It's so easy for me, but still I like to be challenged. And the challenge is to get the best ideas, the most concise ideas to keep getting better and better at my field. And I continue to do that, which is why I've got over 20 books, you know, and it's not easy to write a book. <laughs> it's a, it takes a lot of work. And it's a lot of sacrifice, you know, and I'm, but I'm proud of it and so forth. Uh, that's what makes you masculine. And then you do what you love to do as well. So the flip side of this is for women to learn how to be more feminine, how to find their female feelings inside, connect with that part of them. I see that as a major doorway for women. If you think about masculinity, it's always concerned about here's a goal out there. How do I get there most efficiently? But femininity is more introspective. It's like, okay, I'm in this circumstance. What am I feeling inside? Am I feeling love, appreciation? Is I'm forgiving, I'm accepting, I'm enjoying my life, or what's keeping me from that? Okay, so when I'm, if I'm a guy, I've got to make money. Okay, what's keeping me from making money? As opposed to how can I be more efficient in it? For a woman, we have this wonderful field called psychology that sometimes it's it works. <laughs> I'm really against what they do a lot. And when they don't understand men and women are different. But what you have here is women going to therapists and they'll talk about their feelings. That means they're able to look inside. And that's only useful if you look inside and you can be honest and share what's inside. And if what's inside is not loving, then have the discipline of how do you get back to feeling loving? How do you get back to a positive, optimistic perspective rather than just feeling good, but leaving into, into a life where you feel you're a victim? You see, if you if you leave a therapy session, because a therapy session for a woman can feel really good if nothing gets done, even if something gets done in terms of I have now new knowledge to change my life. I have new knowledge to interpret reality as more friendly and supportive of me. I have new knowledge that gives me hope that I can get what I want and need. I see I'm part of the problem. I can solve the problem. That's what therapy should give everybody. But for women, particularly, they can't get to that. It's I'm part of the problem until first their hormones balance. OK, they need to produce estrogen. And here's the paradox. Uh, if a woman complains for 50 minutes in a therapy session, she'll make a ton of estrogen. It doesn't matter whether she takes responsibility or not. Just talking about problems produces estrogen. And, and you just sit there and talk about problems and you leave the session, nothing's changed in your life, but you do feel better for a little while because you lowered your stress level. In the same way, a guy can be feeling inadequate. Just go online and see some porn and your testosterone levels will go up and they crash right back down because it's not real. And you haven't earned your way into a woman to connect with her female side. You have to be more masculine before a woman really lets you in. What about young people? Because you did touch on this and I thought it was interesting because the, the state of the world at the moment and the messaging, especially around social media, is rather harming and rather damaging because now it's all about self-love, self-acceptance. doesn't matter the size of your body. doesn't matter what you do to yourself. It's just like you got to love yourself for who you are. There's no changing yourself. Don't do hard things. Now you've got toxic masculinity, which is all part of it. And they're just saying that all men are evil, they're terrible human beings. And then now we've got this new transgender agenda and ideology that is infesting the hearts and minds of more young people. And you have these, well, I hesitate to really call them doctors because how can you call them a doctor when they're saying that a child should go on puberty blockers? And I want to ask you, uh, Dr. John, about what, Actually, for those people that don't know, what really goes on when somebody puts a child on puberty blockers, what does it do to their development? 
we are designed at puberty. Now here, understand hormone, natural hormonal development as we age. A little boy for the first two years of his life, he will produce the same hormones that testosterone a grown man will produce. And then after two years, it will drop until puberty. And he's like a little girl. He is like a little girl, but he's got more of a male brain. Mm. Now, having said that, also he's developing his masculinity when he's in the womb as well. He's got penis and all this is all developing. If a mother has been exposed to too many phthalates, uh, phthalates are in plastics and exposed to too much GMO. But these two things, these are toxic, toxic substances that are called endocrine as hormone disruptors. They're hormone disruptors. So depending upon the mother's uh, hormonal state when she's pregnant and what phthalates or disruptors are in her body, it will inhibit the development of the male brain. And so what happens is, you know, he may come out not wanting to play with guns and trucks, okay? <laughs> You'll see these little boys. You know, I just had my, my godson, now he's three years old. He's going... <laughs> <laughs> you know, my my own uh, grand grandson, the, my granddaughter, my my one of my daughters raising him. No guns in the house. He may invent some. You know, boom, 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 boom. This is this is, this is genetics. This is all about masculinity. Is produce the result. Okay, how is that? What video games are all about? Why they're so addictive? Is look, you can move the move it around. Bang, boom, bang. You know, this is all dopamine stimulating. Also produces testosterone. But if the boy didn't develop fully those masculine aspects of his brain, when his brain was developing that, there'll be some confusion. And then suddenly he drops down to his female side for eight years uh, or 10 years. You've got all these this estrogens going up and his testosterone goes down. It's a time where he can have a lot of confusion. It's a time where he needs a lot of support to do behaviors that males typically do. And you have to, he's going to be afraid because it's not instinctive. You know, if you have a real male brain, you don't think before you act. <laughs> you just, you, you know, see something, you just throw your ball wherever it can go. You know, it's like you haven't yet developed consequences and so forth. You learn that. So what happens is uh, you, you basically need to put that little boy in situations which are going to gently support him and aligning himself with the production of male hormones in his body. So he has that experience where he feels safe at the same time doing male things. So if he has like, um, you know, he gets in a gang, he's not going to feel safe, you know? It's, it's, so you have to create situations which are masculine affirming, like going fishing with his dad. And you just sit there in the boat. You don't have to talk. I remember that. That was just such a great experience of just Wow, we don't have to talk at all. We're just holding a fishing rod and just sitting there. It's one of the most peaceful experiences of my whole childhood, which you don't have to always be talking. You can just be doing, and doing can be effortless. It's a very interesting, it's kind of like a meditation is what it was. Yeah. And uh, I went too far in my past there for a moment. I'm, I'm going to get my focus here. On. <laughs> what was the question? Oh, we're talking about all the gender confusion that's going on. And what we want to do is to, to know that it's, it's a real thing, these phthalates. And a phthalate is, is a, or a pesticide. What these things do, endocrine disruptors, they can make little male frogs who have the, the genes of a male frog, you know, have a vagina and, and make them attracted to uh, another male and so forth. Okay, so you make them gay just by putting thyroid th phthalates in them. And now they're... They have this imbalance inside of their brain. It didn't develop attraction for the female. So now it doesn't even have a, a sense of what masculinity is. So you give them the experience of that. Now, keep in mind that most of the confusion is happening in, in boys. They're already on the um, autistic spectrum. Okay, So there's already an imbalance due to what was going on in the mother's womb. Second to that, so what do you do? You give them encouraging behavior and messages to be more masculine, not to be more feminine. So what you're doing is you're rewiring the brain. See, there's nothing more powerful to rewire the brain than outer stimulation. And we know that the brain has plasticity. 
So the plasticity, uh, like, let me give you an example of a woman who, who she's trained her brain to be more masculine and her period comes along. Uh, and then for the next 10, 12 days, her estrogen levels will start to rise automatically biologically. But you can also take a woman at any time in her cycle and treat her with romantic feelings and respect and empathy and understanding. And you can cause that estrogen to go up when if she was an animal, that wouldn't have happened. So we have brain plasticity. Relationship affects us. So you give a little boy the opportunity to feel successful being masculine and a lot of encouragement. His brain will start being rewired as a male, as opposed to he's going to naturally resist some of the things other little boys are doing. He won't feel safe. And the girls, he has the estrogen and they're all estrogen. They will in, include him and support him. And the mother will go, oh, tell me how you're feeling and what is it and tell didn't get the cry. You should cry more. And what's upsetting you? And let's let's. He's going to be afraid to take certain risks, which is part of femininity is security, not taking risks. So you create situations where he can take little risks, and it's safe, and he gets encouragement for that. So what we want is we want to affirm the biological identity of a child rather than to affirm what's most easy and comfortable for them. And that's like my little uh, godson was just here, three years old. Right when he came into the house, I said, oh, my dog's here. He went immediately went down on the floor on four legs and said, and I'm a cat. Meow, meow, meow. And he was a cat for like 30 minutes. And children are dramatically affected their identity. It doesn't, you don't really know who you are. I mean, really get who potentially brain development until you're 28. Mm. We know that the prefrontal cortex of the brain, this part of the brain that has the ability to self-reflect and know who you are doesn't fully develop until you're 28 years old. And it doesn't develop in everybody. It, you know, you have to have education for that to develop. You have to have positive messages from the environment for that to develop. Some people, you know, it just didn't develop. Now, can you develop it later? Well, it used to be the knowledge in psychiatry that your brain was formed in the first seven years of life. Your conditioning is there, but you can change all of that. I'm an example of that for, you know, I, I, I love giving public talks and so forth. But my first talk I gave, I fainted. I had anxiety and massive anxiety before every time I would talk. And I was able to, through psychology, be able to process where did that come from and change the programming inside of me. So where I'm, I never have anxiety. I can't, it's been 40 years since I felt anxiety because of the things I did to change the wiring in my brain. And we now that's brain plasticity. You can change it all, but you can't do it all alone. That's the fallacy. You need to have the environment that, that, that reinforces what you're trying to achieve. So if, if I have anxieties, I can't, and I can't change that until I actually take the risk that I'm resisting taking. But I can, I can minimize the risk so I can take one little step at a time. And I need to get positive feedback. And then I take another risk and I need to get positive feedback. If I don't get positive feedback, then I'm back in my comfort zone. So <laughs> you, you have to be smart about all of this. And you create a rewiring of your brain, which we now know is completely pos possible. This is amazing knowledge, but you have to do it wisely. You know, so we have women going to counseling who just complain and don't learn how to how they're responsible for bringing out the worst of their partner, for example. They usually just complain about their partners or their victim status. And they feel good doing it because if you talk about what you're feeling, whether what you're feeling is real or not real, you will have estrogen. If a man pretends to have sex with a woman who's not real or real, but there's no intimacy, his testosterone will shoot up mm -hmm. because of the dopamine. But now he's dependent upon high dopamine for testosterone to go up. So this is like a boy who doesn't have positive messages at home. He will join a gang because in a gang, he will do dangerous things. And when you do dangerous things and you get reinforcement for doing dangerous things, you produce lots of dopamine through danger. And you also get to fulfill a need of feeling uh, to be included. Every teenager, our primary need is to feel included. And what we want Historically, that need was fulfilled. First of all, people lived in little tribes. Okay, they were little tribes, and yeah. everybody was part of the tribe. So that was that was one, and they all had a family. We got that need met, and then basically the big lesson for males and for females after puberty was 
oh, my tribe is males if you're male, and my tribe is females if you're a female. Now, women's tribe is I'm a victim. This is this, and men's tribe is I'm a, I forget the word they, they say, your perpetrator, your patriarchal evil person. <laughs> you know, that, that's yeah, the tribe you're we're part of, trying yeah. to get out of uh, and, and making ourselves oppressed. Mm. This is, it's all gotten so confusing because we're not getting the truth. Because the truth was back when I started Marcus Venus, that's when it all started, at least some part of the lie started when we started saying men and women were not different. Mm. The whole thing is that we're the same. Now, I'm all for equality. Equality is fairness. Equality does not mean sameness. <laughs> you, if, we're, if we're the same, then we're telling ourselves a lie. And ironically, the people who say that we want inclusion are saying that everybody's different, but they're not saying that men and women are particularly different. <laughs> we're all the same. <laughs> and then... It's become so confusing. And the whole idea of gender doesn't exist. It's what you think. And it, it's not what you think. You have a, a genes feel. and that 99% of the population, those genes determine enormous amounts of how your body regulates hormones. And hormones regulate your well-being. Hormones regulate your feelings of attraction. Your hormones regulate your feelings of aliveness. Everything is motivated, whether we're conscious of it or not. Men are naturally drawn if they're happy in their lives, they're naturally drawn to things that will promote testosterone production. Women are going to be drawn to things that produce estrogen. But estrogen has got a bad name today. Just like, ironically, masculinity is patriarchal and evil, which is not. We have the better, best world we've ever had because primarily the way men have created this world and mothers who created these men who did it. But it's mostly the men are the doers. There's certainly some women doing, but many men doing it. You know, every building, go look at who's building that building. It's men, you know, construction workers, you know, scientists in the lab. Now women are going to their male side. This is good. This is progress where women can be both masculine and feminine, but they're still women. You see, that's the dynamic. You have to have the healthy amount of female hormones, which are produced by relationships to life, to men, to yourself, to the world that promotes estrogen production. Even this whole idea of global warming. Yeah, the planet's warming, but, you know, is it such a crisis? Is it so bad? Is there any, have any of the predictions even been true? No. So we just don't know. But if we have a crisis... Boom, dopamine goes up and everybody's addicted to my well-being dependent upon being in fear. So I'm afraid of, uh, of the climate, what's going to do. Yeah, life has always got uh, uh, moderate levels of fear. You know, my dog just got a, uh, something, these, these stickers got in her ear. And they can actually uh, go deep into the brain and kill a dog if you don't get them out. Okay, so now I go to the doctor, they pull it out, and they go, oh, you got to protect yourself. So now it's August, the, the leaves are dry, so I got to protect herself from these fox, fox something, foxtails. They'll actually go deep inside. It's dangerous. Mm. Yeah, so there's a little bit of die, danger. So I have to put her on a little bit of a leash sometimes. No big deal. Life is always a little bit of danger. But we don't have to create dramatic, ex terrible things. It's like one crisis after another. What does that do? It causes human beings to go into a childlike state where you believe authority. So it's always going in this childlike state where we believe authority. And when you're in that childlike state where you believe authority, then all of your basic uh, limited beliefs about yourself will come up. You'll feel more insecure. You'll feel unhappy. You'll be overreactive because that is our childlike state. We try to evolve out of that. But when you're in fear, elevated cortisol levels, you will automatically go back to this program state. And I think on a certain level, people are waking up today and realizing that what our parents tell us is not always true. <laughs> you know, like you're not, you don't deserve to be loved unless you're perfect. You, know, yeah. you get that message. You got to learn that, wait a second, I, I, I don't have to buy into that anymore. I'm a good guy, even though I'm not perfect, okay? I forgive myself for things, and I don't need to be punished for things. I, I for, learned my lesson. I'm good. So we try to evolve out of this childlike state that was conditioned by all of our parents, poor conditioning from previous generations. And you have to know that the conditioning you got from your parents, and it, it's the same as the conditioning you get when you watch TV. 
when you watch TV, you will tend to go into a theta state, passive absorbing. Now, this is a child for the first seven years is in a theta state. So they're duplicating anything, anything that comes in and how a parent reacts to something, what's going on subconsciously for them, what, what compensations, everything. We're just absorbing their conditioning. And the good news is we can now overcome all of that by you know, doing the kind of things people are teaching now for personal growth, personal development, changing your style. And my, my angle of that, and, and it's not the only angle, okay? So I've written books on health and wellness. You, that's a big part of this whole thing. Uh, and what you eat can cause huge brain problems, addiction foods. Uh, on the other hand, then there's meditation. You know, I've written books on meditation. It's been such a foundation for me that I can, no matter what state, no matter what's going on in my life, practically, some really bad things that happen, I can temporarily reconnect with the balanced part of me. You know, in a sense, it, it's it's uh, one of the themes of meditation is you're forgetting all your problems. <laughs> I can literally forget my problems for a little while and cause my stress levels to go down. It's just now I'm kind of in meditation all the time. My stress levels are down all the time because I keep my hormones balanced, but I still do my meditation. I still do regular making love. That's also... I think it's a very, very powerful, important thing because uh, there's nothing like making love with someone you love, you're committed to, and you're not goal-oriented, and go on and on. What happens then is you charge your body with life force, you know, ecstasy. Now, some people might get close to that by just dancing. Uh, I, I think single women, at least in between dates, and what are dance, you know, this is a move your body in a state of feeling supported by the music and the rhythm, let the rhythm take you over. You know, these are ecstatic states i think we, we've had them all the way throughout history it's very important to have some place in your life where you have that ecstasy but for personal growth the most powerful thing is to to live with your mirror a mirror means somebody's watching you seeing you and if they're if you know if you go to the carnival the mirror is you know it's like round so you look too big or you look too little well sometimes your partner is going to be a, a distorted mirror and you have to be able to say, even though they're in a bad mood, even though they're not seeing me for the truth of who I am, I still am this loving person. I can be forgiving and I can figure out how I'm contributing, what I can do to help them. So that's a big challenge. But you, you don't want to take on too much of that challenge until you have a maturity, which is I can see myself in the mirror and see that I'm a wonderful human being. I deserve to be loved. I'm good enough. All this good stuff is loving yourself, so to speak. Now you'll be challenged. Can you continue loving yourself? That <laughs> your partner doesn't always give you what you're expecting or what you want, what you need. And when they're not, what can you do to come back to your true self? And then what can I do in order to help bring my partner up? Because that's always an option. But ultimately, we have to love ourselves first. And that's a cliche. But how do you do that? Well, you do that by having relationships in your life that aren't dependent on your spouse relationships, whether to my work, to my friends, to my health, to my body, to my children, all of that is called having a life that makes you feel good. Now you can feel gooder than good <laughs> with a, in an intimate relationship or feel worse than worse if you don't have the good skills. I turned 27 yesterday and I so 100% believe you in regards to your brain developing like and you start to realize things at the age of 28, I'm one year away from that, John. <laughs> so I'll get there, believe you me. But I have noticed that things have started to make a lot more sense to me now. Like just before I turned 27 yesterday, life just started to unravel itself for me in ways that I hadn't actually initially thought of or realized. And I was like, oh, Maybe my brain is starting to awaken itself and starting to piece things together. Finally, like, yes. <laughs> but it also came down to my, my interactions with people, my, my environment, right? And my education, things that I was putting into my brain that helped it sort of wire itself in certain ways that just made things make sense. And it was brilliant. I love it. So I totally love your point on that. And it's almost like we're creating like the oppression Olympics in society. It's like, who is the most oppressed? And I'm like, just stop. Like for, for once. And I think TikTok and social media has been really great at this, trying to create a persona 
and young people see it, they copy it. Oh, that looks good. So therefore I'm going to do it as well. And this whole idea of creating a fake kind of society and you got to change your body to look a certain way. You know, they idolize celebrities nowadays. It is, it's a toxic culture that has sort of been created by all these other people that think, you know what, maybe this is a good way of doing things because we're sick and tired of the old way of doing things. So maybe progression is going to be beneficial, but in fact, we're regressing in many, many ways. And it's so harmful. Crime is up in many states. I know in America at the moment, here in Australia, because we've gone too soft. Fathers, they're not taught how to be proper fathers. It hasn't necessarily been passed down properly. And the government is just going, eh, let them off the hook. Give them a slap on the wrist and say, move on. It's totally fine. They'll they'll learn their lesson if we give them a, a little bit of time in, in jail or whatever else. But then when we release them, they're not going to learn their lesson. They're going to go back to doing what they did before, which is, again, a fault of government and societal teachings as a whole. So it's like, huh, where do you see our future, John? Where do you where do you foresee everything? going in the next five, 10 years. Are we totally doomed? Well, that's a great question. And where are we going from here? Well, I talked to my daughter who also teaches classes on online, Mars Venus classes, workshops, and so forth. And by the way, that's at marsvenus.com. People can get more information. But the I tell her about this stuff. She's dad, it's just a fad. It's just a fad. You know, when I was a teenager, you know, you try on this, you try on this, and you grow up and it's just a fad. And, and it will be just a fad. There's no question about it. But what's, what's, what's uh, dangerous is now they're really hurting people with these hormone blockers. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is just an interfering with the natural development of a human being. I and mean, we would go through these natural stages of development, which is God's plan. And you're just interrupting that with a hormone blocker. It's bad enough that our foods, we have GMOs and we have too much plastics and all that. That's bad enough. But then suddenly we're actually giving people the hormone disruptors. That's that's a big, big mistake. And we already know that to be a big, big mistake. And they often justify by saying, well, it's better than suicide. Well, I say, if somebody wants suicide, then they need good therapy. <laughs> you don't give people hormones to change that. It's never been proven. There's no data on it. It's all just, a, it's an agenda. And some people think that, This is the best thing for society. And when they see it's not, people wake up and they change. And I think we've all gone through that, particularly in Australia. when we saw that, you know, lockdowns as a solution to a pandemic is a stupid idea. (laughs) It's a stupid, stupid idea. And uh, I don't think I'm being too radical to say that. (laughs) Uh, People are waking up, which means that we need to stop listening to people uh, who just because they say it, I'm going to follow it. Mm. But I'm going to listen to my heart more. And that's called growing up. And I think the whole, at least the more Western world is waking up to that. And I think even in other places, it's just uh, authority is not always has your best interest. They, they may think they do, but there's an ignorance or they may have their own interests. It clearly is always the case. So in, in a sense, to whatever extent our self-esteem is challenged, our sense of happiness is challenged due to childhood experiences, that's because we as children we made authority always right. So if my parents are mad at me, then I'm wrong, as opposed to maybe they're having a bad day. So part of growing up is to, and to be able to have loving relationships and thrive, as I'm talking about, is the ability to have someone uh, lie to you, mislead you, mistreat you, and for you to be able to not buy into letting them have that effect on you. That you become autonomous, sovereign within yourself. And it's gotten so extreme in all these different areas that people, (laughs) wait a second, I can't always believe what I see on the news, okay? I can't always believe what the authorities are telling me. We need to start challenging and questioning, and that's a really, really good thing. Uh, And that's, that's happening more and more in our world, rather than just being open-hearted and going with the flow, not wanting to ruffle feathers. You know, how did we create democracy in the first place? We fought wars, it's a battle. And I always took it for granted that how could anything less than democracy occur? But the people who made it happen, they say, be careful, you can lose it in an instant. 
And we did. And we're fighting back now. People are waking up and saying, wait a second, wait a second. I need to be reasonable here. But it's hard to be reasonable when you're in a state of fight or flight. You tend to go into a childlike thinking and believe authority. So I'm back to how I felt as a young guy, question authority. You know, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It doesn't mean it's right. Question it. So I have, I have optimistic feelings for the world. I think we're waking up big time. And it, it's sad that some people are going to have to suffer, have suffered so much by believing the lies. But we're coming around. It's only going to get better. Sometimes, and this is very cliche, but sometimes you have to go really left in order to self-correct and go right. And then yeah. for a while, when you're in the middle, it's working. And then you go too far to the right. <laughs> And then you got to go really left. And so we're finding balance. And that's really what I'm teaching couples is how to find balance within yourself mm-hmm. for better relationships with your partner and how to grow your own self-esteem by finding balance within yourself without depending on an intimate partner. Both are very, very important. So thanks so much for a wonderful interview. Well, I, for one, John, am very grateful for you, your work, your wisdom. I feel like I could talk to you for pretty much all day, my friend. (laughs) This has been fantastic. So thank you so much for your time and for joining me today on the Storybox podcast. Thank you.